I'm Alice Loxton and I present documentaries over on History Hit TV. If you're passionate about all things history, sign up to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix, but just for history. We've got hours of ad-free documentaries about all aspects of the past. You can get a huge discount from History Hit TV. Make sure you check out the details below and use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY, all one word when you sign up. Now, on with the show. In the depths of a British winter, the House of Windsor is under siege. Amid calls for an end to monarchy, even its staunchest supporters are making some surprising concessions at a debate in Oxford. We concede that the monarchy is irrelevant, it is undemocratic, it is unrepresentative, it is inbred, it is racist, it is sclerotic, it is anachronistic, and it is also elitist. We think on this side of the house that is everything that the Oxford Union stands for. <laughs> As a symbol and a spokesperson for our nation, why is an elderly, rich, upper-class, uniquely privileged white woman a better choice than someone elected by popular majority? The fundamental issue before us in this debate is whether we believe in democracy or in what is fundamentally a relic of feudalism. Say what they will about the 1,200-year-old monarchy, the world's most coveted photo op is still with the Queen. President of the United States of America, Mrs. Elizabeth reigns like few others. Now 83, she still basks in the afterglow of a spectacular beginning when three million people lined the streets of London for her coronation. Just 27 years old, the striking young monarch seemed to be ushering in a new Elizabethan era, which she'd vowed would last a lifetime. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. The stylish beginning has been followed by nearly six decades of pomp, pageantry, melodrama, and tragedy. The Queen, now the oldest monarch in British history, has aged gracefully and endured stoically just about everything that fate and her family have thrown at her. The Queen is an exemplary figure. Unfortunately, it's all the strap hangers, those lower down the line, that let her down. But here's the rub. Those down the line are in the line of succession. Fearing what may happen when one of the world's hardest acts to follow exits the stage, millions of Elizabeth's fans wish she could live forever. People want the Queen to go on and on and on, but Mrs. Thatcher famously said she was going to go on and on and on, and within a year it was all over for her. The best guarded ravens in the world are found at the Tower of London. Legend has it that if they leave, the kingdom will fall. Their wings are clipped and there's plenty of backup, but chances are the tower will be keeping a close eye on its birds when Elizabeth passes. That's because the next succession will mark a turning point for the House of Windsor, presenting more peril than promise to its dynasty. They have to have the right person leading. If they make a bad choice, then that will be the end of the monarchy. Monarchs once ruled through fear. Today, they must court popularity. A tough job for the controversial and opinionated heir apparent, Prince Charles. 
When Elizabeth Windsor dies and she's replaced by a highly political, deeply weird man, the debate will be transformed, particularly since he has announced that he intends to interfere with politics, using his unelected position to lobby for eccentric political causes. An overtly political king will be death for the monarchy. People who are uncomfortable with Charles sometimes see a savior in his elder son. But 27-year-old William is a reluctant royal, haunted by the deadly price his mother, Princess Diana, paid for fame. He, and especially his brother Harry, have also been living dangerously, serving up some spicy photo ops for the paparazzi. Excessive alcohol, clubbing, partying, women, painting your fingernail, punching, kicking, walking out as a Nazi in a Nazi uniform. I mean, you would never have seen the old royals uh, even dream of doing this. It's live, as it's photographed on the street, it's around the world in literally minutes. Prince Charles was born into a world of great deference to royalty where nobody had even heard of the word paparazzi. Let us give thanks to Almighty God for the birth of a son to Her Royal Highness, the Princess Elizabeth. These are the first newsreel pictures taken since his christening of Prince Charles, now eight months old, the world's most famous baby. The boy born to be king. Charles had a long apprenticeship ahead of him. His mother became queen when he was just three and sometimes abandoned him to nannies for months at a time. Loneliness and his father's stern criticism made him feel insecure and unlistened to, but also toughened him up, says his biographer. He is made of much more steel than some people think. After attending strict boarding schools, Charles got an elite education at Cambridge. He was invested Prince of Wales and polished his CV for King in the armed forces. The prince boogied through his 20s in a carefree quest for a wife and future queen. Charles scored what seemed to everyone a dream bride in Lady Diana Spencer. Wilt thou love her, comfort her, honor and keep her in sickness and in health, and forsaking all other, keep thee only unto her? so long as you both shall live. I will. But the couple's 15-year marriage, which produced Princess William and Harry, unraveled in separation, divorce, and disaster. This is what's left of the Mercedes in which the Princess of Wales and her companion, Dodi Al-Fayed, were being driven back to his house. Witnesses say the car was being pursued by photographers on motorbikes. Eight years after Diana's death, Charles daringly married his longtime lover, Camilla Parker Bowles, and continued waiting to be king. Another military salute for the Prince of Wales as he turns 60. Only one other heir apparent in British history has ever waited so long to take the crown. He is still as determined as ever to be king. He already talks about what his monarchy will be like. It's full steam ahead for Prince Charles to become King Charles, although in my view, he'll become King George because there are too many connotations with King Charles. The first one had his head chopped off after all. The second one was a terrible philandra. And the third one was Bonnie Prince Charlie, who never got to be king. So he may think, Charles, let's go for a safer option. The inauspicious name may be the least of Charles's worries. The man who would be king carries some daunting liabilities. High on the list is the Lady Diana factor. So many people who adored the late Princess of Wales believe that Charles treated her in a shabby manner and only pretended to love her. I suppose we've all been brought up to believe that kings and queens are supposed to be better. Their children, princes and princesses, are supposed to lead by example. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the way of the world today. Charles's missteps began with his engagement. He was secretly in love with another woman and couldn't quite hide it. I'm amazed that she's uh, been brave enough to take me on. <laughs> and I suppose in love. Of course. 
<laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> Flaky to some, cynical to others, Charles's attitude toward the young Diana was anything but forthright. As their relationship disintegrated, the Prince of Wales admitted to two-timing his wife with the still-married Camilla Parker Bowles. His integrity was undermined, his character called into question. Retaliating in a television interview watched by 23 million Britons, Lady Diana did her husband no favors by suggesting that a man confused in his heart is unsuited to be king. I would think that the top job, as I call it, would bring enormous limitations to him. And I don't know whether he could adapt to that. Would it be your wish that when Prince William comes of age, that he were to succeed the Queen rather than the, prince, the current Prince of Wales? My wish is that my husband finds peace of mind, and from that follows other things, yes. For questioning Charles's place in the line of succession, the Princess of Wales was ejected from the royal family and stripped of her title. But Diana's daring insinuation that the crown should skip a generation has survived her death. Today, some people are convinced that the monarchy needs a renewal that Charles cannot bring. William, they say, would be a cool king. Most of the contemporaries that I speak to would insist that actually William is the better person for the job, that in a modern world with a modern monarchy, you need a young, fresh king. Many people look at William and see a lot of Diana. Aesthetically, they're so very, very similar. The same sort of doleful eyes, similar expressions. I think also William has inherited a lot of Diana's kindness. His friends always tell me he's incredibly generous. He's very warm-hearted. But Wills has got a lot of his father in him too, and not just a passion for polo. For seven years, he's been keeping the media guessing about his on-again, off-again girlfriend, Kate Middleton. She's deemed eminently suitable by palace and public, but has had to endure several breakups and has been dubbed Weighty Katie by the press. The young prince may have inherited the romantic confusion that undermined his father. William's indecision is beginning to look like a character flaw. If the relationship with Kate is not what he wants, he needs to end it, because what will be terrible and really devastating for the royal family is if he dumps Kate two or three years down the line and then decides that actually he wants to have a bit of fun, because Kate will be seen as the tragic figure who waited and waited, and he will be seen as a cad. Charles has traveled halfway round the world, and not just to watch the mating dance of the blue-footed boobies. In this place where exotic wildlife inspired Darwin to investigate the origin of species, the future king warns about their coming extinction. He is very much not one of life's optimists. And unhappily, I suspect that on most of the big issues, it's a view that is widely shared because the, the, the future doesn't look great. During a stopover in Brazil, a traditional royal might have danced the samba and left. But Charles is in the heart of the Amazon to voice his horror at the destruction of the rainforest and what he sees as the imminent disaster of climate change. I'm afraid it's got to the point where the urgency and the emergency is such that, as I said the other day in Rio, we do only have 100 months left to act. Back in England, the activist prince serves up organic carrots to school children and blasts genetically modified crops. Never has the world's best known organic farmer expressed his views on GM crops in such negative terms, generally painting a picture of imminent environmental apocalypse. On other days, the prince will opine on anything from inner city problems to educational reform. He was trying to avoid an extremely traditional, extremely conservative model of education that was based on rote learning poetry. Well, I don't think that's, that, that, that's wise and brilliant. I think that's really quite backward. And then there are the grey squirrels. 
Prince Charles wants many of them killed off so the indigenous red squirrel can make a comeback. He's known behind the scenes as the meddling Prince of Wales. He writes letters to government ministers all the time. He bombards them. He drives them insane. By the time he gets to the throne, we'll pretty much know his view on just about everything except who he wants to win the football. Whatever people think of Prince Charles's causes, the question remains how such passionate advocacy can square with a future king who's meant to stay out of politics. Different sovereigns for different times. What I think is a foot in the air, if you like, because these are very delicate constitutional areas, um, is that he will be a more obviously engaged king. He might well use his position on environmental questions, warning, advising more publicly than the Queen could conceivably do. So speaking on behalf of the issues, and he would like to think that's where the delicacy comes in, on behalf of the country as well. Anti-monarchists are up in arms at the very thought of an opinionated king. Charles Windsor keeps saying, you know, I will use the authority of my position to argue for what I believe in. But what he doesn't seem to understand is there is no authority to his position. It's caused by the accident of birth. He has no more right to speak for the British people than the next random person I see at the bus stop. But he seems to have got it into his head that because he happened to have passed through Elizabeth Windsor's womb, he has some mystical right to speak for the nation. He doesn't. In a democracy, authority comes from voting lines, not bloodlines. An awards ceremony at London's Westminster Abbey ends and host Prince Harry leaves with the clergy. This is the way a royal earns his keep without controversy. But the day job can get pretty dull for the young princes. So Harry and William like to mix it up when they have time off. Splash some money around and get into a little trouble. Harry is a master at that. As a teenager, he got busted for underage drinking and smoking dope. Later, he wore a Nazi uniform to a fancy dress party and fought with photographers. That's the kind of action that turns the paparazzi on. It's better than sitting there photographing a waxwork. And let's face it, most royals look like the back end of a bus. The modern generation, it has become absolutely, you know, sexy paparazzi, and the world want to see it. At the height of William and Harry's partying days, a London newspaper reporter set out to investigate some of the exclusive nightclubs famously frequented by the princes. She was well equipped to identify what she was looking for, illegal drugs. I wrote to the US and I bought some of these cocaine swabs. They're used by the CSIs in America and you swab them over a surface and if it's covered in cocaine, it comes up blue. Bougie was the most obvious in terms of the drug use. I mean, effectively, it was like a private house party. You would see a lot of people walking around the club sniffing. When I went to the toilets to swab the lees, I mean, it was just everywhere. And everything in the toilets sort of allowed the drug use. Everything was flat surfaces. There were grooves on the toilet roll holders. At another of the prince's favorite clubs, it was more of the same. When I went into the toilets, there was a tiny, very low ledge on the ground, really covered in grime. And I thought, well, that's the only flat surface. I'll swipe it. And the whole thing, again, turned blue. And there were flecks of cocaine there. So, I mean, literally, girls would have to be on their knees on a really grubby toilet floor snorting cocaine. There is no doubt that all the clubs they were frequenting had cocaine use inside. Perlman's report made no suggestion that the princes themselves were taking cocaine. But the idea of royalty with police protection mingling with illicit drug users raised more than a few eyebrows. When William's $20,000 bar bill one night was leaked to the press, it hardly made things better. It didn't go down well. Our readers didn't like it. They wanted to know what these good-for-nothing princes, and I quote, were up to. Sometimes Prince William was in as serious trouble as his younger brother. But Palace PR strong-armed the press to cover it up. If somebody rang up and said, look, I saw William punch a guy's lights out at a party because it was drunk, that didn't get in the press because the newspaper proprietors and their editors would do deals saying, well, you give me another story and I won't run that bad one about William because William has to be shielded, he has to be protected, he has to be whiter than white. All sorts of Machiavellian things go on in the palace. This, these people are fighting for survival. 
So Harry, the spare, not the heir, is typecast as the black sheep and only occasionally complains about the coverage he gets. There's truth and there's lies, and unfortunately, I can't get the truth across because I don't have my own column in the paper, which I'm thinking about getting. On second thought, Harry decided to forego journalism and focus on his military career. He transformed his image from party boy to fighting royal. His foray into Afghanistan made for some exceptional TV footage. It, at least temporarily, drove the earlier transgressions of swastikas and drunkenness from the public's mind. Should Harry suddenly go off the rails again, I think it could be very damaging for the monarchy. There's no point in having a monarchy unless your public can relate to you and actually can love you. When you have vastly more wealth than most of your subjects, their love is never guaranteed. Especially when taxpayers spend $80 million a year to keep you in style and about $100 million more to protect you. There are a lot of hidden costs to the monarchy. For example, whenever they go on a foreign trip, they charge all their clothes expenses to the local embassy. That's a staggering amount of money. And maybe next time I go to Spain, I'll, I'll charge my clothes bill to the embassy and see what they say. But monarchists and palace PR insist royals are good value for money. Just think of all the tourists they bring in. Or do they? The idea that monarchy is good for tourism doesn't really stand up to scrutiny. The royal palaces rank very lowly in terms of tourist attractions. Windsor Castle, for example, on the top, is even below Legoland, which is just a few miles away. And if you compare, say, the royal palaces in Britain and France, the Palace of Versailles, just outside of Paris, where there are no royals in residence, and the royals have long departed centuries ago, um, it has far, far more tourists than any of the royal palaces in Britain. So we don't need the royals to bring in the tourists. The gritty port town of Liverpool is untouched by royal splendor. But its working class neighborhoods produced the most famous rock group of the 20th century. Buckingham Palace made the upstart Beatles into members of the British Empire in no time. And it's Sir Paul McCartney now. But the monarchy would be hard pressed to co-opt a lot of struggling young people here today. These street musicians playing for change outside the club where the Beatles got their start say it's time for the royal family to bow out. I think the monarchy is a waste of time. So not really doing anything, are they? I'd like to see no one after Elizabeth because um, basically I don't really see a point in the monarchy. So we spend taxes on them to live in a big nice house and that while there's people like going hungry on the streets, you know, that them taxes could go towards feeding. You know, I think it's a bit of a waste. This town, just north of London, is more prosperous than Liverpool and seemingly more friendly to the monarchy. That may have something to do with Huntingdon's history. In the 17th century, native son Oliver Cromwell had King Charles I's head chopped off and created Britain's short-lived republic. It all ended in political chaos and Cromwell's skull was later impaled on a pike in London. Huntingdon residents have drawn a sobering conclusion. I don't think Cromwell's years were particularly happy years for the country. I think we need the stabilising influence of the monarchy. Everything is working well, so leave well alone. My heart tells me that what we have is good. The monarchy has lasted for an awful long time and will probably continue to do so. Long live the Queen! <laughs> The debate on the street continues in the august chambers of the Oxford Union, with star guests and students ready to duke it out for the crowd. Republicans are pushing a motion of no confidence in the monarchy. The Queen's supporters, led by the best student debater in the world, are pushing right back. We like old ladies on this side of the house. We furthermore think that life is pretty tough if you're the Queen. We think that, you know, she has to put up with her family. She has to have lunch with Gordon Brown every week. You know, she's periodically mistaken for Helen Mirren. That's pretty embarrassing. When did we get to choose 
to live under this monarchy? When did we choose to not have a choice? When were our voices heard? When were our votes cast? We have not talked about the vast quantities of money which we heap upon this dysfunctional family. It is incredibly easy to carp at the institution. It's incredibly easy to see its frailties. It does represent the nation quite effectively. I challenge anyone to find a better way of doing it. One of the most offensive aspects of monarchy is that it is based on the principle that even the most immoral, incompetent royal should be our head of state in preference to the most wise and moral commoner. What is great about the monarchy is that they are not hostage to the need to be re-elected the next time round. The monarch cannot be of a party, is not of a party, and is therefore there for everyone. She is neither a Democrat or a Republican or Labour or Conservative. She is just your sovereign, and that is it. Prince William, the reluctant royal, has followed his brother into the military and is burnishing his image as an officer and a gentleman. But unlike Harry, he's not going to get any war zone experience. He's too close to the throne for the country to risk it. The prince has managed to draw fire from his superiors, however, by joyriding with an army helicopter. On the first occasion, he landed a Chinook in a field near the house of girlfriend Kate Middleton. It was the same aircraft he used on a separate occasion to pick up brother Harry en route to a stag party. Peccadillos aside, some see the son of the people's princess becoming the perfect people's king, softening the hard edges and formality associated with the Windsors. But William seemed to lack enthusiasm for the job. Only a few years ago, he was telling friends he would never mount the throne. He had a real problem with his future, a real problem with his destiny. He couldn't get his head around it. He didn't want to be king. He'd seen his mother hounded by the paparazzi day in, day out. It was something he didn't want to have to take on. The media's 24-7 hounding of royalty inspired author Johann Hari to write a book arguing that the monarchy should be abolished on purely humanitarian grounds. In an age of massive media intrusion, to effectively bear children into the Truman Show, where they're constantly going to be watched, they're never going to have any privacy, is extraordinarily cruel to the Windsor family. The cruelty to both young princes was compounded by the obsessive coverage the media gave to their parents' troubled marriage and the circumstances of their mother's death in Paris. They believe, not wrongly, that their mother was chased to death by photographers. Now, to then tell them that they have to spend the rest of their lives working with these people, feeding these people, giving succor to these people, is a pretty cruel thing to do. William's resentment of the media became evident in his teens when a crowd of photographers ambushed him on a day off. He just went crazy and started screaming at them, saying, why are you following me everywhere? Why won't you let me be a normal person? And it's a very good question. Why won't we let him be a normal person? You know, with most celebrities, the intrusion on their privacy can be ugly, but at the end of the day, you can say to them, look, you could have chosen another life. You could have chosen to do something else. You can't say that to William Windsor. In recent years, William seems to have grown more accepting of his fate as a royal in the limelight. One day, he may even relish the thought of becoming king. But that won't bring him any closer to coronation because, barring extraordinary circumstances, his father gets the crown first. These intelligent, engaging journalists who have to fill space will speculate endlessly about whether or not William might succeed. I can tell you, I bet my life on it, bet my house on it, it will not happen. The hereditary principle, which is the only one we've got if you have a monarchy, has to apply, and that is down to the firstborn male. But the firstborn male didn't last very long in Edward VIII's case. In 1936, in a traumatic moment for the royal family and the nation, the prime minister forced Edward to abdicate when the king announced he wanted to marry a divorcee, American Wallace Simpson. A future government, sensing Charles was undermining the monarchy, could depose a king again, says Tony Benn. 
if the establishment of the powers that be thought that Prince Charles would embarrass them or weaken them, they'd jump over and go straight to Prince William. They're only interested in the system. There's no loyalty to the person of the crown. Wedding the mistress who many believe destroyed the Princess of Wales's happiness was a dangerous choice for the future head of the Church of England. With Camilla at Charles's side, the public is constantly reminded of the adulterous ending of his first marriage. Nobody's ever been able to understand why Charles spurned a gorgeous, fabulous, physically attractive woman like Diana for what they thought was an old bag like Camilla. Nobody can understand it, they still can't. No matter how nice Camilla is or how winsome she is and she makes him happy, so that's great for him. But for the public, we feel we've been robbed of that shining star that was Diana. There is enormous residual affection, certainly admiration, for the Princess of Wales uh, and for what she represented, perhaps even as an alternative style of monarchy. So the idea that this can all be airbrushed out of history, which is certainly the hope of, of many of Prince Charles's supporters, I think is, um, is cynical. Mrs Parker Bowles actively contributed to the circumstances in which it became impossible for Charles and Diana to remain married. That history can't be unwritten. While many now accept Camilla as Charles's wife, they draw the line at putting a crown on her head. My own newspaper, on his 60th birthday, we did a poll to say, would you support Camilla Parker Bowles being queen? 78% said no. Now, that's a pretty staggering figure. And in fact, that figure has got worse, not better, in the few years since she's been a member of the royal family. Before Camilla, in the glory days of Charles and Diana, Canadians welcomed the young royals with open arms. It was the continuation of a tradition which, in 1939, saw George VI and the Queen Mother take the country by storm. Later, their daughter, Elizabeth II, could do no wrong here. On the Queen's 2002 tour, when then Deputy Prime Minister John Manley said he'd like her to be Canada's last monarch, he was severely criticized and issued an apology. I'm sorry that it's become a distraction from her visit, but it is possible to concurrently have a great deal of respect for Queen Elizabeth and also to wonder about the future of the institution after her reign ends. A startling new poll done for the Globe and Mail suggests that the royal love affair may be ending. When Elizabeth dies, two out of three Canadians want ties with the crown severed. And that's got supporters of the monarchy worried. Ed Schreier, the former Premier of Manitoba and Governor General, said that on a list of 100 things that need fixing in Canada, the monarchy comes 101st. And I agree. Oh, yeah, that, that doesn't need fixing. We've got a great system, a stable head of state, a stable constitution. It works. Leave it alone. You're throwing out five centuries of tradition. But Canadians may be losing their attachment to that tradition anyway. According to the new poll, Seven out of ten people identify with neither the Queen nor the Governor General. Rideau Hall, the Queen's official residence in Canada, has become a lightning rod for ranting about the royals. And I don't know if you noticed this, but the Queen doesn't really come over here that much, which makes me wonder, why are we paying for all this? I mean, the lights are on, she's not home. And actually, that's the problem. She's at home, in England, in another country. Canadians may grumble, but Australians went a step further. In a referendum in 1999, more than 40% of the electorate voted to dump the monarchy. I think it's very likely that, certainly on the death of Queen Elizabeth, if not before, that Australia will become a republic. And that will be bound to have an effect on public opinion in this country. I think people here will be emboldened to feel that a republic is possible. The idea of former colonies becoming republics delights those Britons who have long called for an end to the power and privilege symbolized by Buckingham Palace. The existence of the crown legitimizes privilege right the way through society. The hereditary system is ridiculous. If you went to the dentist and just as he started drilling your teeth, he said to you, I'm not a dentist myself, but my father was a very good dentist, you'd jump out of his chair. I mean, it's ludicrous that people should inherit power. Ludicrous. Charles employs an army of spin doctors to counter this kind of criticism and bolster his image as a benign prince. 
everything is subordinated to keeping the spotlight on the future monarch and his consort, which means Waity Katie may have to wait some more. I think that Charles' advice is a bit cautious about approving a match too soon for William because if he married Kate Middleton, who would be interested in Charles and Camilla? They would disappear off the map. So William's indecision fits well with his father's agenda. Primed with a $30 million income from the Duchy of Cornwall, the Prince of Wales projects power and influence all over the United Kingdom. In many respects, the Prince of Wales is already king. He operates a court which is, in many respects, as grand as anything you find in Buckingham Palace. It grows all the time, it's extremely well funded, and Prince Charles enjoys many of the trappings of being a monarch right now. Like monarchs of yore, Prince Charles intends to put his stamp on the architecture of his kingdom. The curious can get a sneak preview by visiting Poundbury in southwest England. It looks like a quaint old village, but it's all brand new. The Prince of Wales, who dislikes most modern architecture, has championed this development as the embodiment of the British tradition. I don't think he's old-fashioned. I just think he has good values, good standards. Charles is here today to encourage planners and developers to replicate his Back to the Future vision all across the country. But some people say that vision is as anachronistic as the monarchy itself. Critics have derided Poundbury as a jumbled pastiche of antiquated styles. A London tabloid ridiculed the local pub as dating back to last Monday. But none of that bothers a couple who have lived here for six years. The Birches say their home is solidly built from local materials and is modern inside. They've become big fans of the prince who dreamt it all up. He's grown in stature as far as I'm concerned. I feel he's got his feet on the ground. I do feel that he ought to be given a greater voice because he does say a lot of very sensible things that a lot of us would like to say but don't have the power to do so. Trouble is, many people feel that Charles's values are not what a modern Britain needs. It's great that we have a future king who is aesthetically aware. The only problem is that means you have to share his sense of aesthetics. Case in point, the former Chelsea Barracks in the heart of London. A huge complex of luxury apartment buildings was slated for construction here. At $6 billion, Britain's most expensive residential development ever. In a letter to the investor, the Prince of Qatar, the Prince of Wales took umbrage at the steel and glass plans, killing the project with the stroke of a royal pen. The impact of this intervention from the Prince is that people will lose their jobs. The scheme is dead. A huge amount of hard work has effectively gone down the drain. We believe that our constitution doesn't really make space for royal personages to be involved in specific planning applications. <laughs> It's time for spectators at the debate in Oxford to decide if they think there's any space for royalty in Britain's future. Those with no confidence in the monarchy exit to the right to cast their vote. Those who support it leave to the left. It looks a little too close to call this evening, and that's with Elizabeth still queen. I have the results of tonight's debate. Votes in proposition of the motion, 114. In opposition to the motion, 155. Therefore, the motion falls. The monarchy survives the vote of no confidence by a surprisingly narrow margin in this bastion of the British establishment. The Queen's cavalry strut their stuff for her official birthday. The RAF salutes her overhead. It's a display of might that makes the monarchy look indestructible. But appearances belie a royal family at odds with itself. Prince Charles, wed to a woman few want to see queen, but determined to fulfill the ambition of a lifetime, is being kept from the throne by his aging mother, who has vowed never to abdicate. She is there until she draws her last breath. There is no question that she would step aside. It's not in her psyche. She's deeply religious, she has made that vow to God, and that's the way it's going to be. 
The Queen's court at the palace is already clashing with Charles's court at Clarence House. The Clarence House people don't seem to take any notice of what Buckingham Palace does, so there are like two warring camps. History has always shown us the heir's court is always in competition with the monarch's court. There are also underlying tensions which are the result of what is a, an ambitious growing court surrounding the man who one day will be the head of state. The young prince, whom some would love to see ride to the rescue of a troubled monarchy, can't barring an extraordinary intervention from the government in the distant future. The only way Prince William would replace his father is if the Prime Minister of the day and the Cabinet gang up on Prince Charles, maybe he's aged 77 or 78, and say, we think it's time, sir, to skip to another generation. Then they would probably compel him to stand down. As things are, the current royal stalemate could drag on for years with potentially fatal consequences for the Windsors. What they say at Buckingham Palace is, oh, we play the long game. We know that it might be a bit slow at the moment or a bit of a dip, but it'll all come back. You wait and see. I say to them, you can't afford to wait and see. Meanwhile, the public are drifting away in droves. If the public aren't interested in you, you die. So time could yet be the undoing of a dynasty that dates back more than a thousand years to the Saxon kings, but looks oddly anachronistic today. As the reign of an unimpeachable queen draws slowly to a close, the clock may be running out on her controversial son and the monarchy itself. After Queen Elizabeth, I suspect that Prince Charles will eventually struggle to the throne but with greatly diminished public support. And then when he goes, I think it will be the end. He will be Charles the last.